No, okay. Um, thank you very much um, for joining with us today. Um, this is an extremely important webinar. I know that all eyes right now are on Ukraine, but that does not negate the fact that very, very important things are happening elsewhere in the world, such as right now in Vienna. Unfortunately, there was a report coming out today that the Iranian says the nuclear talks are at a critical stage and they are optimistic, optimistic about a chance of a deal. The Iranian foreign minister Hassan Amir Abdul Ahyan said on Wednesday that the negotiations had reached a critical and an important stage. Here to talk with us today about all of this is someone who has had a profound impact on me personally in terms of shaping my worldview about foreign policy being predicated on sober-headed realism rather than on wishful thinking. Um, Ambassador Yoram Ettinger is the former Minister of Congressional Affairs um, at Israel's Embassy in Washington, D.C., and the former Counselor General of the Southwest Region of the United States in Houston, Texas. Um, he has worked for many, many years as a consultant on U.S.-Israel relations and consults with Knesset members um, and cabinet members and I am very, very honored to say that for the last few months, Ambassador Ettinger has been joining um, Gabe Toole, um, Hussein Abubakar Mansour, and myself on our Zoom calls with members of Congress and staffers. And he adds a tremendous amount because of his years and years of amassed knowledge and wisdom about American foreign policy. Um, so, and um, Ambassador Ettinger is frequently sought out by um, television stations and radio stations in Israel um, to consult about the latest developments on a whole myriad of issues. So at this point, and without further ado, um, you are in for a treat because Ambassador Ettinger is going to talk to us about the past diplomatic history with the United States and Iran and how we could possibly learn from those mistakes. Yerm? Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to start very briefly uh, uh, about myself because there may be many among you, some among you who haven't met me before. So just briefly uh, for 10 years, I uh, headed a Middle East unit uh, uh, in the civil service. In fact, I established that unit and ran it for 10 years. Uh, I served as uh, the head of the government press office dealing with foreign journalists in Israel. Uh, I was uh, in charge of Israel's congressional relations at the Israeli embassy in Washington uh, for three years. And before that, uh, I served as Israel's Consul General to the Southwestern States based in Houston, Texas. And uh, I confess that uh, three years in Houston, Texas, uh, plus my undergraduate, which I did in El Paso, Texas, and many, many visits to uh, Texas, have left a major uh, impact on me as far as Texas uh, culture uh, and Texas state of uh, mind, uh, which I believe is very relevant to the topic which we are discussing right now, the Iran uh, issue, is it uh, uh, amenable to negotiation or to uh, confrontation and what has been the track uh, record, it's relevant uh, because uh, uh, some years ago, uh, one of the top country Western singers had a hit and uh, part of some of the lyrics of that uh, country Western hit were, I've got some oceanfront property in Arizona and if you'll buy that, I'll throw the Golden Gate in for free. Uh, it seems to me 
that apparently the Iranians studied that song very, very well. They're singing it. And some people in Washington are very serious about uh, buying an oceanfront property in Arizona from that uh, Iranian partner to negotiation. Uh, the, the key element uh, in understanding the process right now is to realize that after four years of being totally sidelined, once again, the State Department is back at center stage as far as setting America's foreign policy and in many respects, national security uh, policy as it was until uh, January 2017. And uh, the track record of the State Department leading US foreign policy and national security in the Middle East uh, is very, very systematic. It's a systematically a blundering type of uh, record. Um, we're talking about the 2015 uh, JCPOA, and uh, uh, that was based on some assumptions that uh, the agreement was going to moderate the Iranians, the agreement was going to convince them to depart from their uh, very radical imperialistic uh, uh, religious uh, goal, uh, and uh, one by one, every single assumption uh, was uh, crashed against the rocks of Middle East uh, reality. Before that, we saw the State Department leading the charge, uh, which uh, produced the military front of NATO uh, against Gaddafi. The idea was that Gaddafi must be punished for violation of human rights in Libya. Well, uh, it was a successful military operation which transformed Libya uh, to a totally uncontrollable uh, state. And therefore it has become since 2011, uh, one of the key platforms of international Islamic anti-US uh, terrorism. Before that, or about the same time, we had the eruption on the Arab uh, street from uh, Northwest Africa all the way to the Persian Gulf and down to uh, Yemen and up all the way to Syria. And we heard from the State Department that, that was an Arab Spring and that was the March of uh, Peace and Freedom. And that was uh, Facebook and Youth uh, Revolution. It escaped their mind that that was uh, classically or a classic case of another Middle East uh, tsunami. Uh, which haunts us, by the way, until this very uh, day. Uh, if we go back uh, to 1990, until 1990, the State Department embraced Saddam Hussein as a close uh, ally. Uh, U.S. had uh, intelligence agreements with Saddam Hussein, uh, financial agreements with Saddam Hussein, and provided Saddam Hussein with dual-use systems, which very few countries received at that uh, time. And that went on literally until the day of Saddam's invasion of Kuwait, and his aim was to proceed and topple the regime of every single pro-American Arab uh, country in the Persian Gulf, uh, the Arab uh, Arabian uh, Peninsula. Uh, by the way, um, in 1993, uh, the US uh, joined, uh, in my mind, reckless Israeli leaders who uh, concocted the Oslo Accord, and it was the US which heralded Yasser Arafat for his transformation from a lead terrorist to a lead peacemaker, ushering all the way to get the Nobel uh, Prize. And I could go on and on and on. We don't have much time, but I'll go only all the way to 1948 when it was the State Department, by the way, at that time, along with the CIA, along with the uh, Pentagon, along with the New York Times, along with the Washington Post, which led a very brutal uh, assault on the idea of establishing a Jewish state. And again, 
series of wrong uh, assumptions. Uh, the Jewish state was supposed to be, according to the State Department, a uh, pro-Soviet uh, entity, uh, was supposed to be a feeble entity which wouldn't be able to hold its own against the surrounding Arab uh, countries and uh, uh, was supposed was supposed to uh, undermine severely U.S.-Arab uh, relations. Uh, everything, everything uh, got shattered against the rocks of uh, reality in the uh, Middle East. The bottom line is that, once again, we have the same State Department with a very similar, if not identical, global state of mind leading U.S. policy on Iran and featuring or featuring elements of uh, this uh, approach towards Iran is the uh, basic precepts of State Department state of mind, namely multilateralism, rather than rather than an independent unilateral U.S. action. Multilateralism basically means seeking common denominator with vacillating Europe, which lost its will to fight uh, rogue regimes long time uh, ago. Multilateralism, uh, as de defined by the State Department, also means common denominator with the UN, which is fundamentally anti-American uh, organization. Hence, the US policy towards Iran, and obviously, State Department uh, approach means uh, you shelve the military uh, option uh, and uh, you uh, take lightly, you take lightly the past track record and you uh, elevate, elevate the weight of uh, speculative future track uh, record. And once again, uh, we are witnessing a rogue uh, regime, in this case, uh, the Ayatollahs of Iran, re receiving an attitude by the State Department as if they were a uh, good faith uh, negotiator. Uh, when it comes to a good faith negotiator and the overall state of mind of uh, Iran, while the State Department takes very lightly, many times ignore uh, past track uh, record, uh, it also takes lightly the critical historical milestones which have shaped, which have shaped the uh, the policy of the and the strategy, the vision of Iran's Ayatollah since taking over control of Iran in February of 1979. And those milestones are uh, uh, very much in touch or embedded in the major trait of the Middle East, namely long, long, long memory. Uh, Western societies uh, tend to focus on present and future. As far as the Middle East is concerned, it's history at the foundation of the ethos, of the education, of the culture, and of the day-to-day -day, uh, policies. In this case, it goes back 1400 years, the appearance of Islam, which triggered a fight, a war, in fact, conf major conflict, between the Sunni majority and the Shiite minority. The Ayatollahs of Iran represent obviously the very radical wing of Shiite uh, Islam. A major uh, a milestone took place in 680 AD, the Battle of Karbala, where uh, uh, the very small army of uh, Hussein bin Ali, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, was defeated and killed by the superior military uh, force of the Caliph at that uh, time. And that uh, yielded uh, a sense or produced a sense of uh, treachery by the Shiite and a sense of martyrdom and a sense of deep, deep vengeance for that defeat 
in 680. During the 10th and 11th century, another milestone shaping today's state of mind of the Ayatollah of Iran, 10th and 11th century, uh, the Shiites uh, were able to dominate substantial parts of Egypt and Syria and Lebanon and Iraq and Yemen. In fact, uh, Iran all the way to the Caspian uh, Sea and that uh, provided them a sense of capability to dominate uh, the Sunni majority in 1501. Uh, uh, Iran's official religion was declared to be Shiite Islam until uh, today it is the official uh, official uh, religion, not only official, but this is according to them by divine uh, right. This is the only uh, legitimate uh, type of religion, not the so-called apostate Sunnis, not the so-called infidel uh, Christians and Buddhists and uh, Jews, but the only legitimate uh, religion, Shiite uh, Islam. And the last milestone, which I will mention, 1979, when the Ayatollahs took over uh, control of, uh, of Iran, uh, toppling the rule of the Shah of uh, Iran. And that leads me to another key issue uh, for us to understand the current uh, policy by the US towards uh, towards Iran, towards Iran's uh, ayatollahs, and that's the very striking similarities of today's policy to 2015 JCPOA policy in 1979. And I refer specifically to, again, uh, George Strait's uh, lyrics, I've got some ocean from property in Arizona, and if you buy that, you'll get the Golden Gate in free. Literally days before returning from exile in Paris to uh, Tehran to take over control of uh, Iran, Ayatollah Khomeini and his advisors were in contact with President Carter, with National Security Advisor Brzezinski, and with uh, uh, Secretary of State uh, Vance and other key uh, people uh, in the policy making apparatus of Washington. The message coming out of Ayatollah Khomeini was uh, why, why, do you, why do you worry? I'm anti-communist and therefore I appreciate the USA. Uh, I'm not going to export the Islamic uh, revolution. I'm going to take care of domestic issues. And my concern is to bring about the liberty and human rights to uh, Iran after years of despotic uh, rule. And when it comes to uh, my relations with uh, Sunni Arab countries, no problems, absolutely no uh, problem. Uh, it resonated uh, very, very naively uh, so, or naively well uh, in Washington to the extent that uh, Assistant Secretary, Secretary of uh, State uh, in charge of Middle East, Harold Saunders, uh, opined that as far as he was concerned, there were absolutely no signs of any eruption of Islamic revolution in Iran uh, and uh, no, no concern, no deep concern for Ayatollah, uh, Iran's uh, Ayatollah Khomeini uh, taking over control. The ambassador, US ambassador to Tehran, William Burns, uh, he wrote to Washington that he expected Ayatollah Khomeini to be a Gandhi-like, a Gandhi-like Iranian leader. And President Carter uh, uh, shared with global leaders uh, convening in the Guadeloupe Island 10 days, 10 days before the landing of Khomeini. And according to President Jimmy Carter, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini was expected to be preoccupied with acquiring tractors, not tanks, namely 
uh, butter, not uh, gun. How off, how wrong uh, could they be? Or maybe how uh, overly simplistic uh, uh, they could be to buy that oceanfront property in Arizona from the Iranian uh, partner to uh, uh, dealings or negotiations. Similar state of mind prevailed in uh, 2015, uh, and we saw the financial bonanza, the diplomatic bonanza showered upon the Ayatollahs, led by, as led by the USA. All that bonanza was not dedicated to buy tractors to enhance upgrade standards of standards of living in Iran. It was dedicated as was expected, as we were told by the writing on the wall, it was dedicated to buy more guns, to spread, to proliferate uh, subversion and terrorism in the Persian Gulf, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, throughout the Middle East, in Central Asia, in the Horn of Africa, North Africa, Central Africa, Western Africa, all the way to Latin, all the way to uh, Latin America. And when one talks about Latin America, uh, we should realize that the conventional wisdom uh, that uh, professes that Israel is the top target for uh, the Ayatollahs of Iran is absolutely off uh, the marks. Because when you observe the actual walk of the Ayatollahs, not only their talk, you realize that they have a mega goal. And again, the mega goal, as I mentioned briefly before, goes back to the seventh uh, century, the 10th and the 16th uh, century. It has to do with a very fanatic megalomaniacal type of uh, vision, which embraces the entire uh, globe. We're talking about a mega goal, uh, which in order to be realized has to uh, overcome a mega obstacle. Israel is not the mega obstacle. A mega obstacle is what they refer to the, the great uh, Satan, the great American uh, Satan. In order to get the mega obstacle off the road, which would enable them to reach their mega goal, uh, they need they need to develop the mega capability, which happens to be not only nuclear, but very, very advanced ballistic missile capabilities, very advanced uh, predator unmanned aerial vehicles, which by the way, uh, recently they have uh, uh, tried and they are attempting to export all the way to South and Central America, all the way to the US-Mexico uh, border. And uh, that mega uh, goal, which I was talking about, features in their education system. And there's nothing which more authentically reflects who we are as people than that which we educate our children. And certainly the education system in uh, Iran, the Ayatollah's education system, by the way, just like the Palestinian Authority education uh, system tells us all about who are the Ayatollahs or who are the uh, people in the Palestinian uh, Authority. And that once again talks about establishing a universal Shiite Islamic uh, society ruled by uh, the Shiite interpretation of the uh, Quran and bringing the infidel to submission preferably peacefully, but if not, through the sword, militarily. And when it comes to the actual pursuit, as I mentioned before, it goes way, way beyond the Persian Gulf and beyond the Middle East. In fact, it's right there on the American uh, continent. Uh, uh, it has been going on there since the 1980s with the Ayatollahs of Iran, 
in collaboration with their proxy Hezbollah uh, terrorists, establishing a very, very well entrenched foothold in South America and in Central America with an increasing number of sleeper cells in the US itself. In South America, their major uh, foothold have been two trilateral border areas, um, uh, Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil, and a smaller but still very significant trilateral border area between Chile and uh, Peru and um, uh, Bolivia. And those trilateral areas, which have been lawless for many years, have been very fertile for terror organizations, for drug cartels, including the Ayatollahs of Iran and Hezbollah, which have developed very intimate, very intimate uh, ties with the major drug cartels of Mexico and Colombia and Bolivia. We're talking about very close ties between the Ayatollahs and Hezbollah on the one hand and terror organizations in South America and most importantly for the Ayatollahs, very close strategic ties between them and every single anti-American government in Latin America led by Venezuela, also Cuba and Nicaragua and Bolivia and Ecuador and recently uh, Chile. Uh, you froze. I think you were to... going to say increasingly Chile. You froze for a, uh, an increasingly Chile, right? <laughs> Par pardon me? Our internet connection was just unstable. I think you froze a little bit. I think you were going to say an increasingly Chile, right? led by the, um, the, the <laughs> unfortunately, the computer connection, you froze in the mid-sentence. I see, okay, no, no problem. Uh, there, there, have been, there have been very uh, intimate ties which led to the establishment of training camps for terrorists in South uh, America, where they train local uh, terrorists in, uh, in uh, preparing improvised explosive devices car bombs and urging people to become martyrs, to, uh, be, to become suicide bombers. More recently, they also export, have exported to South and Central America the equipment and technology to, uh, to build uh, tunnels uh, in the mode of the tunnels between Sinai Peninsula and Gaza, which have facilitated the smuggling of military systems and, uh, uh, and, and uh, equipment uh, into uh, Gaza and similar tunnels between Gaza and uh, Israel, where they are trying to smuggle in terrorists. They attempt to do the same thing along the U.S.-Mexico uh, border. Again, the bottom line, uh, we're talking about uh, the Ayatollahs of Iran who have approached the U.S. as the number one enemy of the Islamic revolution, which they are in the process of exporting all over the world. Uh, against that background, uh, one of the key uh, mistakes of the current uh, negotiation has been uh, for the U.S. to uh, uh, waive the military option and waive the option of regime change. When one deals with a rogue uh, regime, and the track record is unmistakably extremely rogue, starting with February 1979 until this uh, very day. When you deal with a rogue uh, partner or a rogue entity, you don't remove the club of military operation from above the head of that uh, uh, par rogue partner, because once you remove it, you basically uh, concede. And now the question is, how badly are you going to lose the, uh, the uh, negotiation process with that rogue regime? And here I uh, will end by referring everyone, if you haven't done it yet, to uh, look in, uh, on the internet 
for a February 2nd floor speech by the uh, Democratic chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Robert Menendez. Uh, he gave uh, over one hour speech on this uh, issue, uh, which was to put it mildly, very strident uh, criticism of uh, President Biden's policy on Iran. And he concluded it by saying hope, or I would say wishful thinking is not a national uh, security strategy. Uh, I would like to end uh, here uh, with uh, uh, a small ancient uh, anecdote, and this goes back to Roman uh, time, uh, where the Roman uh, people used to enjoy watching uh, in the arena uh, uh, men uh, fighting lions. And one of those occasions uh, that poor man uh, was in the arena awaiting the lion and he figured I stand no chance against the lion. Only thing I can do is pray and he knelt uh, down and covered his head and started praying. And he heard the dungeon gate open and the crowd yelling blood, blood, blood. And he heard the lion roaming toward him and suddenly silent, absolute silent. The first thing he thought that he must be dead. But then he said, well, if I can reflect, I must be alive. And he opened his eyes and he was astonished. The lion was actually lying two feet away from him with his paws covering his own, the lion's uh, head. And he said, my goodness, it worked. And he said, psst, psst, lion, are you also praying? And the lion said, oh, yes, I'm saying grace. I, I hope this is not the current case of the Western world dealing with Iran. But uh, since 79, this indeed uh, has been the case. And I will welcome uh, your not only questions, but opinions and preferably uh, critical opinions. Thank you so much, Jerome. First of all, I want to apologize. I didn't mean to be disruptive. The um, computer problem was on my end when you froze. Um, but I also feel it's incredibly important um, to savor these words and remember Santayana's adage about those who don't study history are doomed to repeat its mistakes. Um, at, at this point, um, you have covered a tremendous amount of ground and all of the questions I was going to, to, um, to talk to you about. And you've just, um, and particularly about um, the Iranian influence just south of our border and within the domestic United States. Um, could you also talk about um, Iran's um, hegemonic reach and what it's doing in Africa right now? Well, uh, as far as Iran is concerned, uh, Latin America uh, is the soft underbelly of the USA and therefore uh, they focus on Latin America. When it comes to Africa, they consider it to be an extension of their strategic uh, depth on one hand and on the other hand, also the soft underbelly of so-called infidel uh, Europe. And as a result, they uh, have been very busy, again, going back to the 1980s in North uh, Africa. More recently, they have targeted the very critical Horn of Africa because the Horn of Africa controls the Strait of Babel Mandeb. The Horn of Africa is across the Red Sea from Saudi Arabia, which they perceive to be absolutely illegitimate and the Strait of Babel Mandeb control the trade between Asia and Europe. They control much of the exportation of Persian Gulf uh, oil. And as a result, uh, Horn of Africa has attracted the Ayatollahs of uh, Iran. 
as has been the case in West Africa. In West Africa, by the way, they are working once again with Hezbollah uh, terrorists, their proxies, and both of them are leveraging the very successful Lebanese community communities in West Africa, that they have been there for 70, some of them 70, 80 years, very successful financially, some of them Shiites, and therefore have become willing partners of Hezbollah and the Ayatollahs of uh, Iran. But as it applies to the US, they are coordinating their efforts with the drug cartels in Latin America facilitating the uh, uh, marketing of uh, those uh, drugs uh, in Africa and through Africa into uh, Europe. Uh, both in West Africa and Latin America, they establish major centers of money laundering. And we're not talking about a few million or a few hundred million. We're talking about a few billion dollars which have facilitated the expansion of the terrorist infrastructure in Latin America and in Africa, but also financing terror operations against pro-American Arab regimes in the, uh, in the Middle East. And the bottom line is that whether it's Africa or Latin America, it represents the megalomaniacal 1400 year old vision upheld by the Ayatollahs to ignore that vision and to take lightly their reference in their education system, in their weekly sermons in the mosque, in their public rallies, to ignore their reference to their grand vision is to commit a major self-destruct act which already injured the interest of the USA when the USA stabbed the back of the shelf Iran and provided tailwind to Ayatollah Khomeini. It, pro it accorded further damage to the US when the US provided the Ayatollahs of Iran, some say up to $150 billion financial bonanza back in 2015, which intensified anti-American terrorism, another such error could lead to a very, very destructive uh, impact on the mainland of the US itself. Wonderful. And now it's my honor to turn the podium over to our wonderful colleague, Hussein Abubakar Mansour, who will read some of the questions that have come in. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much, uh, Yoram, for such a wonderful presentation. We received a, a lot of words of uh, thanks uh, for you for such a timely and uh, urgent uh, uh, presentation in a very urgent time. Uh, we've received a number of questions from uh, our audiences and number of questions. Uh, please uh, continue to send us uh, your questions through either the chat or the Q&A button. Um, I'm going to start with a, a question that we got actually from several people. What should the U.S. be doing right now, in your opinion? Well, uh, it seems to me uh, that when you examine the track record of the Ayatollahs, the track record of the past, the track record of the present, you come to a very common sense uh, conclusion. Now, there are those who do not want to accord past and present track record a prominent role because many times in the Middle East, especially, it's very inconvenient track record. It's very frustrating track record. Uh, and they prefer a speculative future track record. I am a firm believer in the centrality of past and present uh, track record as the foundation of future policy, future uh, uh, steps. And therefore, such a track record uh, does underline or does highlight the Ayatollahs of Iran as not amenable to negotiation. 
we have tried again and again and again. And how many times uh, do you want to ignore the very fundamental lesson of fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Uh, the U.S. was fooled uh, uh, already three times by the Ayatollahs. How many more times does the U.S. need to be fooled to realize they are not partners of good faith, they are not amenable to uh, peaceful coexistence with their Sunni Arab neighbors, they are not going to be induced by a gigantic bonanza like financial and diplomatic uh, package, they are not going to be induced through that package to depart from their most fundamental 1,400-year-old uh, uh, vision. And therefore, the conclusion in my mind is that there must be a regime change. Uh, I don't think it's possible to do it uh, peacefully. And the only way to do it, obviously, is uh, militarily. Uh, and there are many, many military options to conduct it. Uh, some may say, and rightly so, that the military option could be very costly. Uh, that's, uh, that's true. Uh, but uh, once again, we're dealing with the Middle East, and in the Middle East, with the most radical, unpredictable, violent, intolerant uh, entity. And the question is, uh, why, why would anybody expect free lunches? under such circumstances. But most importantly, while I'm willing to accept the assumption that there could be some very severe cost, although personally, I think that uh, US military, uh, US uh, Israel uh, coordinated military, or even Israel on its, uh, on its own, uh, could carry out such an operation without the most the ultra severe cost but let's assume i'm wrong and those are going to be severe cost would anybody uh, uh challenge my determination that regardless how severe would be the cost of preemptive military action uh, wouldn't those very severe costs be dwarfed by a nuclear iran by an iran which topples every single pro-American Sunni Arab regime in the Persian Gulf and Iran, which strengthened its uh, entrenchment in Mexico and throughout the whole of Latin America. And if indeed it's a common sense and sensible assumption that the cost of a nuclear Iran would dwarf the cost of preemption, uh, what are we waiting for? And it resembles uh, 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 a doctor who specializes in uh, treating cancer cases, and he uh, uh, discovers uh, the very initial stages of uh, cancer. Uh, he's not going to advise the patient to wait because I don't want to irritate the body by treating you at this stage. Let's see if the cancer grows. You treat it right there because you know, allowing the cancer to grow, to grow could be lethal and could be terminal. And I would not underestimate uh, the devastating cost to the world as a whole by a nuclear Iran, which would become a reality if the State Department state of mind is allowed to persist in uh, its current mode. Um, thank you. We received multiple questions uh, actually about the State Department specifically. Um, so the State Department seems to be unable to learn from its own mistakes. Um, they have a lot of the, the same staff that kind of have the same vision. Uh, but then we received a, a number of questions. What about President Biden? If, if this is how the State Department sees things, why not the White House or the administration uh, offer a different view? And, and who can... Uh, you think, in, uh, or in your opinion, who can talk to the Biden administration or President Biden uh, to try to change their vision, if any? Well, in, in my humble mind, uh, uh, there's one key 
architect of President Biden's foreign and national security policy. And this is Secretary of State uh, Tony Blinken, who has been with the president since uh, Biden's days as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations uh, Committee. Uh, Secretary Blinken is responsible for most, maybe even all, appointments in the area of foreign policy and national security. He is the one who sets the, uh, the policy. And I don't see President Biden uh, challenging uh, Secretary of State uh, Blinken, because it's not only Blinken, it's also a national security advisor, uh, Jake Sullivan, uh, who I believe is there because of his close relationship with uh, Secretary uh, Blinken, as is the case with the uh, CAA director, William uh, Burns, and series of other top uh, appointments, top officials in the area of foreign policy and national security. Uh, it seems to me, and I hope I'm wrong, it seems to me that the chance of changing the worldview of the key foreign policy and national security policy of the Biden administration, the chance for that is anywhere between zilch and uh, none. But on the other hand, let's not uh, forget that uh, we are dealing with a US political system and under the constitution and according to litany, litany of uh, precedents, the legislature, the house and the Senate are co-equal, co-determining, not only in the domestic uh, uh, environment as uh, is conventionally believed, they are co-equal and co-determining in the area of national security and in the area of foreign policy. In fact, when it comes to Iran, one talks about sanctions. Will they be uh, remain there or will they be uh, uh, taken uh, uh, off? Uh, most, most sanctions, are the, have been the product of the legislature, many times against the will of president. Uh, Congress uh, imposed sanctions on Russia in defiance of President Trump. Congress imposed sanctions on the Muslim Brotherhood rule of Egypt against the policy of President uh, Obama. And uh, one can go on and on discussing such precedents uh, all the way, all the way uh, to the Jackson uh, Vanik Amendment, uh, which enabled over 1 million Jews to come to uh, Israel from the former Soviet Union. Uh, it was legislated in defiance of President uh, Nixon. Uh, the US military uh, evacuated uh, Nicaragua and Angola and obviously Southeast Asia because Congress wanted it irrespective of the American presidents who did not want and uh, end at that time to US military involvement in those uh, areas. And again, there are many other such examples. And I mentioned that because in my mind, the most constructive uh, partner or interlocutor for changing US policy on Iran is not the executive, but the legislature where you have a much more open-mindedness than in the administration. Uh, let's not forget that in 2015, there were four Democrats who voted against the JCPOA. In 2015, uh, the Senate did not have the right, the, the sufficient vote to, uh, 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 to confirm uh, the uh, JCPOA, uh, and that enabled later on the U.S. to uh, take uh, uh, to take off from the JCPOA. Uh, one of the four Democrats who uh, was there and did not enable ratification of uh, the JCPOA was the current chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Robert Menendez. 
along with him, there were uh, Senator uh, uh, Ben Cardin, uh, uh, Senator Manchin, and uh, today's majority leader, Chuck uh, Schumer. Uh, I would be shocked if you don't have at least uh, three, five more Democrats who would join uh, Chairman uh, Robert Menendez in opposition to any agreement signed under the current state of mind signed with, uh, with Iran. Uh, and therefore, in my mind, the uh, most constructive interlocutor uh, is the legislature. And we received a number of questions. I'm going to try to combine them in one questions and ask it in, with my own words. Here you have um, a revisionist state, a sponsor of terrorism, deep strategic ties with countries like Venezuela, with countries like China, with countries like Russia, um, threatening um, the stability of the Middle East, threatening the existence of Israel, threatening the strategic interests of the United States. But yet you have this insistence um, on trying to um, have the deal and try to lift the sanctions. Uh, what, how, how do you explain this? And maybe this is a little bit of speculative. Are we talking about a misreading? Are we talking about naivete? Are we talking about a kind of profound miscalculation? Um, or there is some other motive here for the State Department and the U.S. administration or, or the Biden administration to insist on behaving this way with Iran? Well, one, one could ask the same question about the State Department uh, causing up to Saddam Hussein, as I said before, until literally the day of the August uh, 1990 invasion of uh, Kuwait. Uh, and the US State Department did not uh, believe that this was going to uh, happen. Uh, I was at that time in Washington and I remember a panel discussion, I was invited to participate. And next to me was a very senior member uh, of the State uh, Department. In fact, since then he ascended in uh, importance. And uh, uh, the topic was uh, the current state of the Middle East. And the senior member of the State Department uh, started the, this panel discussion and he dedicated his 20 minutes to the Palestinian issue. How central is the Palestinian issue? How uh, important it is for all Arab regimes, et cetera, et cetera. And then they turned to me and my initial sentence was, I'm very surprised at my friend whom I uh, highly respect to dedicate 20 minutes to a tertiary, maybe fourth or fifth rate issue in the Middle East. While we may be, by the way, that uh, panel took place in April or May of 1990, a uh, few months before the invasion. And I said, well, we may be a few weeks or few months before an invasion by Saddam Hussein of his province 19. That's how we referred to uh, Kuwait. And I think uh, my friend here should have uh, dedicated his time to this issue, which I uh, would like to do. When I concluded uh, the, the uh, moderator turned to the stop high ranking State Department person. And he uh, asked him, well, uh, how do you uh, respond to what we heard from Mr. Edinger? And the response was, you were just privy to a slick right wing Israeli excuse, excuse not to do the right thing with regard to the Palestinians. And as I said, that was April, May, August came the invasion. Uh, how did it happen? Well, it happened for the same reason that Bashar Assad was welcomed by the State Department as a moderate leader. Why? Because he was the president of the Syrian Internet Association. Wow. He was educated in England. He worked in England. And better yet, he was married to a Syrian girl who was born in London in uh, in England, and therefore, uh, and he spoke foreign languages. Well, he must be uh, moderate. You may think that this is uh, not serious 
description, but this is exactly how they referred uh, to Bashar Assad. By the way, in the Senate at that time, uh, Senator John Kerry referred in a similar manner to Bashar Assad, and he befriended Bashar Assad. Uh, they used to meet uh, Bashar and John Kerry with their wives when uh, the Kerry's the, visited Damascus, uh, just as it was between John Kerry and uh, Hafez Assad, namely the senior uh, Assad. Uh, why would you be surprised when that was exactly how they welcomed uh, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini in 79. Why would you be surprised when this is exactly how they welcomed Yasser uh, Arafat and how they welcome Mahmoud Abbas uh, today, ignoring his hate education, ignoring his financial support of terrorism, ignoring his public events, urging martyrdom against uh, Israel, uh, ignoring his uh, uh, vicious, vicious pro-terrorist and anti-peace uh, activities, while focusing only on his very soothing uh, talk and ignoring the rule that with all due respect to talk, walk is much more interest in, uh, much more important. Uh, in my uh, mind, uh, this is one of the traits of Westerners. Uh, we in the West truly and genuinely want peace around the world. We genuinely want to believe that everyone can uh, change. We genuinely believe that standard of living, of education, of welfare, of medicine, of, uh, of uh, uh, agriculture is much more important than military might. Sadly, sadly, most of the world does not subscribe to Western values or Western institutions. And time after time, uh, US policymakers stumbled on that uh, assumption, again, driven by very genuinely positive uh, uh, wishes and ambitions. But uh, you cannot, you cannot uh, proceed uh, securely if you base your walk on very, very uh, uh, sensitive uh, foundation of wishful thinking. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Yerim, um, for really your years and years of accumulated wisdom and experience. Um, as you know, one of my favorite expressions is from um, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, who likes to, who had said, we in the West make a great mistake when we transpose our values onto the rest of the world. Yeah. So um, I, I, I encourage people to, to share this tape. It will be going around or this recording will be going around tomorrow, um, if not today, um, and to share it with their friends so that people can learn from Yoram's excellent, excellent presentation. Um, I'd also like um, to thank you. Um, next week, we will be having Stephen Blank, who is an expert on Russia and Eurasia. And uh, rather than our normal time on Wednesday at 12, at Um, by bringing these wonderful, marvelous experts um, into your living rooms. We really would like to encourage you to support Amet as best you can. Um, and if you could go to www.ametonline.org, that helps keep the lights on and to, to keep us running. Um, thank you very much. And I cannot thank um, Ambassador Yoram Enter enough for um, the phenomenal, phenomenal presentation that he just gave us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.